Foster Care Nation. Listen up. This is Foster Care and on Paralyzed Terminator. Strength for the powerless. Courage for the fearful. Hope and healing for wounded hearts. And welcome back to Foster Care, an unparalleled journey with Jason and Amanda. Today we're talking with Laura Hernandez. Laura has a story. And I say that a lot. Most of the people that we talk to have a story. That's why they're here. Laura has more than a story. She's got one, I think. One, two, skip a few. Close to 10 stories that live with her. <laughs> How are you doing today, Laura? I'm great. I'm so glad to be here with you guys. Excellent. Excellent. We're glad to have you. You know, we have a lot of kids, seven kids. People look at us and say all the great things like you do know how that happens, don't you? And I always enjoy looking at them saying, actually, <laughs> actually, you'd be wrong. They didn't all show up that way, you know, <laughs> um, but you actually can look at us and call us like the beginners. I mean, I wouldn't say that. You guys <laughs> are a large family, but have a few more on you. 10 kids. We were talking a little bit before we started recording and I asked your kids age and you have one, four, six, seven, eight, eight, not twins, 10, 11, 12, and 14. That is correct. How many panic attacks just happened to people listening to this right here? (laughs) That is a lot. So I guess first off, I got to ask, you know, how did you get into this journey? Well, That is a very loaded question. So we had our first three biological children um, and all three of them were not planned. All of them just kind of happened. We're one of those families that is really obnoxious. And so we had our first three and we had always talked about adoption. So when we were getting married, that was kind of one of my criteria of, hey, if you're not on board with adoption, this is done. We're not getting married, right? And so my husband came around and was like, for sure, let's do it. But then once we had our three kids, he was like, we need to hurry up and adopt or otherwise we're going to accidentally get pregnant again. And I don't think I can do any more than four. Like that's going to be my max. He only signed up for two. You know, I was kind of, kind of shaking him already. So (laughs) we went to our, our church had an adoption class and we went to the adoption class and we really thought that I had wanted to adopt from Africa. He wanted to adopt from China. So we really thought that we were going to be doing a foreign adoption. And then the foster care panel came up. And they started talking all about foster care and all these things. And we both looked at each other. And I mean, nobody wants to do foster care, right? Like it's, you're signing up to get your heart broken over and over again. Yes, and you so, are. <laughs> so it's like, I don't, we, that's, that's off the table. We're not doing that. And, but while the foster care panel is talking, we both look at each other and go, oh crap. Like we both know immediately that that's what we're being called to do. And so we started that process and we did all the training and we got Andrew placed with us when he was three days old straight from the hospital and we fell in love with him he was like our baby he had a ton of health stuff and so we were spending nights in the hospital and feeding tubes and all these things he was just really had a lot of health issues so we were kind of nursing him which I think increased the bond tremendously um but he went back to his mom at eight months old she checked all the boxes this is her Andrew would, was her fourth biological child and all three of the others had been taken away. Um, and so everybody was saying, there's no way that she's going to get him back. Like this is your, it's pretty much a done deal. Right. So, which, you know, that's never the case. It, right? is, a done de- <laughs> it is a done deal until it isn't. Yes. Um, until those papers are signed, it's nothing. Yes. Yeah, so we, got our hearts broken. It was like our child was being taken away and we we're just crushed. And I don't know, it was, it was really hard. Um, so then fast forward to my husband really wanted to move to Seattle to work because he worked for Microsoft here, but couldn't really move up. And so he was like, well, I need to go to Seattle. And so I said, the only way we're going to Seattle is if, <laughs> if I can have another baby. And so we had another baby, <laughs> moved to Seattle. And while we were there, we ended up having our fifth biological child. So thus far, we've only tried to have one child and we were successful. So then we had our fifth up in Seattle. And then 
the week that we had our fifth biological child, that next Sunday was Palm Sunday. And when we were at church, the pastor was giving a sermon on Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. And he was talking about Jesus, who Jesus was weeping for. And it kind of went through all the categories of like the broken, and which I, I just thought was the most random sermon ever. But he said, he said, Jesus was weeping for the orphan. And I was like, okay, I don't, I just, up until this point, we had pursued and reached out to, to CPS. I'm wondering if I can backtrack just a little bit. Certainly go ahead. There's so much here. So when we moved up to Seattle, we would check in with bio mom and keep track of her. She had her, another biological child who was two months away from our fourth biological child. His name is Matthew. So she's down in Louisiana area and ends up moving right across the border to Texas in a little town called Port Arthur. And, um, while she was there, like I am from Southeast Texas. So I feel like the Lord just kind of placed her right down there in that little corner. And so we could go visit whenever we came back to Texas because all my family's there. And so we go from Seattle down to Southeast Texas and we could drop in on them and check in on them and see how they're doing. Um, she went ahead and had another kid. <laughs> so she had Hannah and Hannah, sweet Hannah. When we went to visit them, Hannah was six months old and she weighed eight pounds. And so it was just really, there was just a lot going on there and a lot of things that were really not great for them. Um, and CPS ended up coming and taking them out of that situation and putting them in another home. And so while they were in that other home, I would call CPS and I would check in CPS and they never called me back. I think they thought I was cuckoo. And so I just call all the different people <laughs> at CPS. Like I literally got the directory of CPS and just called them each and said, Hey, would you pass this message on to their caseworker? Um, and so that Palm Sunday that we we're at church and he was talking about weeping for the orphan. I was like, okay, Lord, I, I can't do this anymore. Like I, at some point I just have to trust you and trust that you know what you're doing but I still want to advocate. Like, I'm not sure how to obey you here to trust or to advocate. And so um, I said, I'm going to call one more time. And then just kind of my, my Gideon's wool out. And I said, I'm going to call one more time. And if they don't call me back, then I'll, I'll be done. And I'll just trust that you're going to do what's best. And the next day she called me back and she thought I was nuts. She said, I've never had somebody call to just check on kids before. I don't know what you want. What do you need? <laughs> I, like, I really just want to know how they are. I want to know how I can minister or help the other family that has them now. Can I buy them diapers? Like, what can we do to help them? And she, she really just thought it was really odd. And so once we kind of got over the, her shock that we actually wanted to help and which is shocking to me that nobody ever volunteers help for these little buddies or pursues them after they're taken away. It's kind of, it's just sad. But she started to talk more about Andrew and all of his, all of his behaviors and said, you know, we're really thinking about putting him in a group home because his behaviors are so bad. And so immediately we'll take him. What do we need to do? And she was like, well, okay, we'll, we'll start down this road. And so we ended up doing foster care and private adoption and all these things up in Seattle to try to get the kids to move up there. And we had, they kind of said, you have to either take all of them or none of them. We're going to keep them together. So however we can make that happen, that's what we're doing. So over the course of like two months, we tried everything in our power to get these kids up to Seattle. Um, we hired attorneys, we contacted local authorities, like we did whatever we could, like the government, the government agencies and legislatures, like we, we wrote letters, we did, I mean, we did so much and it basically turned down came down to like the ICPC. Is that what it's called? Interstate. Yeah, the, the, the interstate compact something. So, uh, yeah. ICPC. That's it. We just, we just had an ICPC case in our house recently. So that's, that's how I know that's what it's called. It's fresh in your mind. It's kind of, I'm glad that it's so distant from my mind. Yeah. That lady up in Seattle was just against us and against us having these kids. We already had so many kids and in Texas, we have group homes mm -hmm. that well, we used to. We don't anymore. 
but they didn't have anything like that in Seattle. So they thought we were nuts that we wanted to do this. And we had so many young kids. And so they're like, we're just not taking on this liability. And so we had kind of, my husband and I had talked about like, what are we going to do if they just say no, what are we going to do? And so we knew that moment, like when they said, it's just not happening. We said, okay, we're going to pack up everything and move to Texas. So we had about a month span before they found a new home for the kids um, to sell our house, to sell our cars, to pack up everything, to find a home down here and to move everything down here. And then we had to do foster care training again down here because our foster care license from way back before had expired, nothing up in Seattle counted. And so we've gone through the training so many times. Oh yeah. But I, I think it's important to back up just for a second and point something out. You packed up your life and sold a house and bought a house and quit a job and found a job and all that for, for kids that aren't your biological kids. That's not common. That's true. <laughs> it's true. That, that says something about you as, as a family, that you would go through that much work for kids that weren't your biological family. I assume these aren't like your nephews and nieces or anything like that, right? No. These are just random kids that, that were placed on your heart and, and you picked everything up and moved from Oregon all the way to Texas. That, that's, that's a big thing. And because people think that we do foster care for money, that's a really common thought process we right i see you laugh i see you laugh <laughs> I, I laugh too I, I don't know what texas oregon does missouri is, is one of the lowest paid states in the, in the whole nation so i always laugh when people say that to us but but how much how much money is it really worth to ha when you have to sell your house and your cars and find a new job and and move halfway across the country that's that's huge yeah and not i'm like you're saying this now and now like five years in i'm like and they're continually destroying our house and we're continually having to like redo stuff in our house because they're picking at walls or punching holes in things like it's just constant and so <laughs> i feel like they're not paying us enough to even like upkeep what they're destroying right uh, i have pick yes, marks okay. and holes up yeah yeah i feel you <laughs> as soon as you said picking i wanted to look at his face to see the reaction because yeah <laughs> so, we have so a, there we have an older home that has the old plaster and lath walls in it uh -huh. And I have a five-year-old who seems to think that if there's anything he can pick at, he wants to get through the plaster for whatever reason. And I suck at fixing it so far. It drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I just, what, what was it that, that made you want to move that far for, for, like I said, basically random kids that were placed on your heart. What's that motivation yeah. there? I think it was just obedience. Like I, both of us felt very strongly that we were supposed to do this. And so we wanted to be obedient to that. Um, like that the Lord was calling us to adopt these kids. And we kind of sat back and said like, Hey, would we regret it if we stayed here and did nothing? And our answer was yes. And then we kind of thought through like, okay, would we regret it if we sold everything, moved down there, and then we didn't end up getting them at all. Like we went through the whole process and they ended up going to someone else. Like, would we regret that? And we're like, no, because we know we did everything in our power to keep them safe. And I think that it, it helps a lot that we got to see the circumstances that they were living in um, several times, like in several different areas and several different homes because they move like every three months. And so I think seeing that helps helped me want to keep them safe like that just put a little more fire under me too of like I'm very passionate about wanting to keep them safe and fed and healthy and yeah wow <laughs> wow that, that's that just speaks loads to who you and your husband are because that's just such an uncommon occurrence especially when you're fighting with the ICPC and in the middle of all that and all those struggles it's really easy to throw your hands up and say look I've done what I can I can't do any more. Yeah, I never thought that was an option, I guess. Like, it never felt like an option. It was always like, he's our son. We want him with us. How can we make that happen? 
So, so you guys ended up moving, moving back to Texas without any guarantees. Yes. That would be very difficult. I, I don't know how, how I would do that, you know, to pick up and leave my support system and probably friends and lots of connections and yeah, I mean, it helped that we had already built all that here in the Dallas area too. So we had a great foster care community and um, we knew the area well. And I, I mean, I, I love Texas with all my heart. So. <laughs> well, yeah, you Texans, you Texans <laughs> tend to be that way, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's obnoxious to everyone else, but. I was stationed in, in uh, San Angelo for a little while. Uh-huh. And um, I, I did not have such a high view of Texas as most Texans did. But if you're familiar with San Angelo, they have oil rigs, uh, they have cactuses, and they have jackrabbits the size of German shepherds. And that's that and they have 130 degree temperatures. Yeah, I've never been there. And I don't think I ever want to go there. <laughs> you need to come over, come up and over a little bit. <laughs> yes. I, well, actually, we, we went down to Corpus on vacation. We took our kids down there once. Several years ago, yeah. We had a blast, though. And the yeah, had a blast. that was a good time. And, yeah, we've, we've seen other parts of Texas that are fun, but I always love giving Texans trouble over that, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think you just like to give trouble, but. Well, that may be. <laughs> that may be. So you guys moved back down there, and, and I assume you were able to uh, to get get that situation into, your, in, into where you had hoped? Yes, and it. You know, the whole time it felt like the world was against us, like especially up there. Nobody trusted us. Nobody wanted us to have the kids. Like it just felt very alone. Um, and even fr- like close friends and family would say things like, are you sure you want to do this? Are you, which, you know, it's always such an encouraging thing to hear when you're making huge life choices. And even when <laughs> we, when we moved, <laughs> so when we moved down, and we were about to go drive and get the kids the next day. Like, so we're all set up. We're ready to go. We've done the training. We're approved. And we're going to go down to where they are and pick them up and bring them home. I get a call from our agency in the Dallas area. And the lady says, are you sure you want to do this? I was just reading through this report. And I was so infuriated. because like We just gave up everything to come down here and get these kids like hell we're gonna go get them like this is not okay it made me so angry she was like i'm reading through this and some of his behaviors are just really bad and i'm like great we know about this we're going to get the kids like this is not you're not changing our minds on this and so we went down and got him and brought him back and it kind of felt like it felt like we just watched a nuclear bomb go off and every day I'd be like, Oh gosh, <laughs> I didn't know what to do. Cause it was a different kid coming back to us. And I had that knowledge, but I just, I wasn't expecting all the emotions and I didn't know these other two kids at all. And, but now they're kind of mine and it was just so awkward and hard. It was so hard. And what we didn't know at the time was that they had special needs, um, which made, which made them more, more difficult, I believe. And so over the years of, of waiting for them to kind of catch up, we kind of un- unveiled some of the special needs and that gave a lot of light to why that season was so hard that I didn't even know. And that is what took you to the full 10 kids, right? That took us to eight. To and eight. Two more after that. <laughs> So some people appreciate punishment. (laughs) (laughs) I could do bio babies all day long. Like (laughs) the connection there that, I mean, like, that's just, I love that. Like, that's not a thing for me. (laughs) Adopted buddies are hard. Yeah. Yeah. Now I have to say that I, I can kind of understand why the workers would be asking those questions. Like, are you sure you, because I mean, let's be honest, you guys are weird ducks. Like you picked everything up, you moved across the country to, to take care of kids. Like these, this isn't things that people normally hear. And you did it because you wanted to. And again, this is something that most caseworkers don't, don't see often at all. I mean, bio groups, sibling groups, they're, they're hard to place sometimes when they're big groups and they see people struggle with, with just taking in, you know, three, four kids, 
alone, let alone having bio kids on top of that and all the other struggles in, in your life. So I guess I kind of understand why they would be like, are you sure you know what you're getting into? Well, the other thing you have to look at is the benefit of the kids too. And if, if this is another placement that doesn't work out, that's re-traumatization. And, you know, there, there's a lot of things that, you know, people on the outside don't necessarily see. Yeah, for sure. And I, you know, one of the things that they had talked about if we weren't going to be taking the kids was that they were going to go to two siblings, two adopted siblings of bio mom. And I got kind of fired up about that because kind of not, not that I thought that they were going to be um, like a failed placement, but because they weren't around the first time, like when he was a baby and got out of the hospital, nobody from the family stepped up and said, I'll take him. Like when he was the easiest, the easiest possible scenario right from the hospital, Right. nobody said they'd take him. And so I was like, why are you doing this now? Like what <laughs> do I don't understand? And so the intentions. Yeah. And I'm sure that they were fine intentions. It was kind of like, okay, I guess we'll do it. But at the same time, I just, I didn't like that. It just rubbed me the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned that these kids had special needs that had not been diagnosed or addressed. What kind of special needs did you find? Many, many kinds. (laughs) So we kept waiting for them to catch up, you know, and I think this, this is one of the things that in adoption people talk about often of like once they're in a safe home and they feel safe and they have that felt safety around them after about two years, they'll really start to catch up mentally and developably developmentally and all these things. Right. Like I've read that so many times that there's like a two year magical mark that just they're perfect after that. Right. (laughs) That's not what they say, but they like catch up and they're great. Right. Um, so we kept waiting and I was like, they're still really behind. And so we had children that were right next to them. Right. So we had another, like Matthew was two and we had another two-year-old and we could see the, the vast difference between the two. Um, and same with Andrew and same with Hannah. Like we had, we had samples all around us to kind of be like, yeah, you should be doing faster than that. The baby was passing up Hannah and in development. And so um, we got, you know, we already had a ton of therapies going and our first, one of our first things was that Matthew had a seizure and with that seizure, we took him in and the neurologist did the EEG and in the EEG, he was like, well, there's something else going on too. He did have a seizure, but um, his processing speed is a little slow. And I, y'all, I didn't know anything about special needs people at all. Like I just didn't know anything. And so it's like, okay, sounds great. Like just didn't have a clue for what that was, he was talking about. And I was like, so what does that mean? He said, well, we call this global delay when there's several things that they're behind it. I was like, okay. So he, he just continued to talk. And I was like, what is like, so when he grows up, like right now he's two years behind, but what does that mean when he's 15? Like what in his school, he'll be acting like a seven-year-old when he's like 15. Like he's just kind of trying to lay it out for me of what this developmentally looks like down the road. And once I got home and I saw all the things after I looked them up, I was like, oh, I see. Like he's, he's mentally retarded. I didn't have a category for what the doctor was saying until that, that happened. And what they say now is intellectually and developmentally delayed. So it's mm-hmm. called IDD and it's the new PC term for mental retardation, which I had no idea. And I'm kind of trying to share with the world because if a doctor says, they have ID or something like that. You're like, okay, great. But I feel like I had a, had a bucket for mental retardation, but I didn't have one for these new acronyms that were being thrown at me. Yeah. I, I've never heard that phrase either. And Amanda actually used to work at um at a home for some older ladies who all had, and they call it MR there, don't they? It's called an MR. Um, some people, like, there's, a, there's several terms, but um, they like to, that particular company like to use the word spirited adults. Oh, I love that. So, uh, but yeah, I, I took care of four ladies with special needs and it was one of the most rewarding times of my life. I love that. You know, it was, it was wonderful. Yeah. So that, that's one of those things that a lot of people, uh, you're right. I've, n- I've never heard that term either. Intellectually yeah. and developmentally delayed. Yeah, and like in school, the kids like to sped, you know. Yeah. yeah it's it's all changed a wide range of like 
they yeah. could have severe autism or they could have ADD, you know? So it's kind of a huge yeah. range. What um, other um, special needs have you encountered? So all three of them have fetal alcohol syndrome disorder. Okay. And we were under the impression because mom told us that she never drank. And for whatever reason, I chose to believe that. And so I was kind of shocked that a therapist said, well, they're kind of walking like the only time I've ever seen a kid walk like that with that gait is kid who's had fetal alcohol. And I was like, oh, I never, it never crossed my mind that she would lie to me about that or not tell the truth on that, which sounds kind of naive. And I get that. Um, but I was very surprised by that. So when we went to go get everything I read about fetal alcohol, it's like diagnose them early, get that diagnosis because there's so many things later on down the road that you're going to need to have that for. But after 18, you can't diagnose it. So we went to a behavior, a cognitive behavior doctor. I think he has a better name than that. But I don't know what it is. Cognitive behavior therapy. Yeah, but it wasn't therapy. He's like okay. a, a diagnostic guy. Okay. Simply diagnosis kids. Um, so we took them in and he explained it to me like that they each have the umbrella of FASD and then each of them has different things underneath. So all of them have ADHD. Andrew has a growth hormone deficiency and they all three have IDD. That's a bucket. It's a bucket. And it's, I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot besides the letters. There's a lot going on here. Um, and now we are, I feel like every year it's like discovering new things that, oh my goodness, this is going on too. It's kind of like we kind of whittled it down to, okay, we've got these big things out of the way. Now we can kind of see other small things that are popping up as well. So what's been, been you guys' best resources to, to work through some of that? I think the best resources for that has been kind of building the team around us. Um, so we had a great therapist in play. It took us a really long time to find a neurologist who understood. We had a lot of the issues with Andrew, like sneaking out of the house in the middle of the night. And he was four at the time and would go a mile down the road and we would, you know, had all the doors locked, put alarms on all the doors. And so then he would sneak out the windows and then we'd lock all the windows and he would just figure out how to un like do undo the latches. And my goodness, it was a lot. So it took us a while to find the doctor who could actually understand what was going on because we did go to a sleep specialist who made him pre pinky promise that he wouldn't get out of bed at night. <laughs> That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Uh, I couldn't uh, believe that I wasted my time there. And he was like the leading sleep specialist at the children's hospital in Dallas. Like ridiculous. That's an amazing theory. I'm going to try that one out and see if that works. Oh my gosh. All that to say, we we're kind of at our, everybody was like, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to do. And so Pinky Promise was kind of the last straw. And so we found, after that, we found our neurologist who we adore and who kind of gets Andrew a little bit more. Um, so having him and having our, our therapists that we love who are on our team and having people come in and help, I think asking for help has been huge so if it would just boil it down to one thing i think asking for help is what it is and to keep pushing through when it feels hard and you're not sure what to do next just keep pushing through now uh and this might be a better question for your husband because i know us guys are wired this way for sure um what point did you finally get to where you realized you didn't have all the answers you couldn't fix it all yourself and you needed to reach out for that help for some somewhere else That's funny that you think that's a guy thing. Because I definitely well. think it's a woman thing. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mom thing. It's hard to admit. Because this is kind of my domain, right? Running the house and the kids. Like, that's kind of what I do. It's my job. And when I kind of have to wave the white flag and say, like, I can't take care of all these children by myself. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't, like, they're, they're driving me crazy. I don't know how to make all these things happen. I need help. Like, that feels like a that has been in my past as coaching mamas. I feel like that's their hardest thing is asking for help, whether that's from a spouse or um, seeking out therapist or like having a babysitter come over to help you. Like whatever that is, it's hard for them to be like, I can't do it all and I need help. 
Yeah. Amanda had to run off to go apply fresh duct tape to keep a kid stuck to the wall, I think. And <laughs> I think she would probably agree with you. I've heard her say very similar things over the years. I just know that as guys, we are, we are pretty hardwired to think that we can fix it all. And that's, that's just our thing. We, we fix things. Like, as a matter of fact, I was on a call with the guy earlier today and he was wearing a shirt that just said, I fix things. <laughs> that's part of who we are, right? That's what we do. Yeah. We fix things. And so that moment of finally realizing that I don't fix everything. I can't, I don't have all the answers. I might think I do when I started this journey, but life teaches us different. And it's amazing the things I've learned from my kids. And that's one of them is that I can't fix everything. I don't have all the answers. It sounds like your kids really taught you that lesson as well. Yes, very early on. I mean, very early, <laughs> very early on. I feel like those first few days of like, ooh, um, just reaching out for help. And because nobody had our story, nobody had our journey. It was very unique. And so, so I would read books and I'd read blogs and I'd search and search for somebody who has our story so I could gain some encouragement. And there was absolutely nothing out there. And so I think I realized very early on that I needed help. I just didn't know how to get it. So if you were to talk to the mom out there who's in the middle of that moment right now, what would your, your best, the best way you could encourage them to go find help? What, what would you say to them? Well, I'd say, call me and I'll, I'll help you find the help you need. I feel like it's such a broad thing and it's so like a mom could be so, I, I work with so many moms that their first words to me are, I feel like I'm drowning. Um, and I get that. I've been there. So I feel like I've been in these places of just hard and feeling overwhelmed and feeling like you're drowning. And there's all these people that are relying on you and you can't do it. You simply can't do it. And so it could be like overwhelmed from the workload at home, like laundry and dishes and mess and all that. Or it could be more, not more serious. It could be deeper and be like diagnoses or needing to apply for programs to receive help from the government with your special needs buddies. Like, I feel like there's a whole spectrum there and every, every family is so different. I imagine with having three kids who've dealt with special needs, you probably have a couple appointments you have to keep up with every, every week as well. I have about 20. Weekly? <laughs> Weekly. Wow. How do you find time for all of that? Well, that's been one of the things I've asked for help on. And it's also been very humbling to, to do that because so all of the, all of the appointments that are like neurology appointment or I'm like, what's that work? Well, child checks. Like I clearly take them to those appointments, but all the PT and OT and counselor and all the other things that everyone has on a weekly basis, I, we hire babysitters to go take them to those appointments and then bring them home. And so I'm not waiting in a waiting room. The babysitter's waiting in the waiting room. And it was a pride, it was definitely a pride humbling thing, which you wouldn't think that it would be, but I had to kind of get over what is the therapist going to think about me if I'm having somebody else, like I'm not showing up to these appointments. Like, what are they going to think about? Like, I'm not a good mom or I don't know, but I've learned that my time is so much better spent at home, kind of being the orchestrator of things here than it is sitting in an office and not doing anything or trying to cram in a few errands or whatever that is. Like my time is much better spent here. So that's just, wow. I had never honestly thought of that. I'm just, I'm sitting here and like all this time is flashing before my eyes. And I'm thinking of how many times I've sat in those exact offices and how long it took and how I didn't have time in the week for other things. And wow, that's, that's a wildly interesting idea. Yeah. And the babysitters don't mind it so much because they can sit and read or do homework or whatever they're doing, but they're getting paid for it. Right. So they're just sitting there working away and they, it's a third year child. That one sounds you, so you, simple. You may have opened up so many things for me just right oh, there. I hope so. I'm like, wow. Yeah, we, <laughs> that one seems really obvious that we should all figure that out by now. Um, <clears throat> but 
No, like vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, though, that's a, I mean, that's almost like when in the jackpot. It is because you're just at home and can continue to keep things moving and dinner. Because what would happen was I would go pick them up from school and then I would go sit in the waiting room until dinner time. I'd come home and like frazzledly put something together or like try to pull something off. Yeah. And then we junk pizza because we were so late for this or that. And yes. And during that time that I'm at the office, all the other children are destroying the home. <laughs> or if another babysitter has been here, the babysitter's not running the home. Like I, you know, they're all watching TV. The house is still a mess, like whatever that, that looks like. And so then I come home and be so frustrated that I, I mean, it would be so frustrated that nothing got done and people haven't done their jobs and all these things. So yeah. it's just really a, a win-win absolutely no that's yeah because there's plenty of days and weeks that i just feel like the human mom taxi cab yeah it's not so much right now in the middle of covid a lot of those appointments have kind of kind of quieted down a little bit but god knows this is all going to go away and they're going to want to bring us back in the office and charge full price again soon well and all the sports with all the kids and stuff yeah i mean how can you cram one more thing into an already packed schedule i see on the sign the the board behind you you've got the sign for mama systems and talking with you before you said you you've really learned to work a lot of things out and that that's part of what you help coach people through talk about that a little bit would you yeah so i from all of my searching for answers for our family when I felt like we just watched a nuclear bomb go off, um, I <laughs> I would search and search. I didn't know anybody who had our family. Like nobody had 10 kids, three adopted. Those three were in public school. So the bus was coming we homeschooled the rest. And I'd read books and they, if they're about like giving out kids tasks or large families, most of them homeschooled. They didn't talk about therapists coming in and out of the home all day or driving people to therapy or to school. Like we, I just felt like we were just so unique. <laughs> what I've learned is that every family is so unique with each kid. Every kid is so unique and every family is so unique. And with that, no book or blog or podcast, no idea is going to work perfectly for your family. There's going to have to be some tweaking. There's going to have to be some customization there for things to really go as planned. Um, and so I get to help moms kind of work through all of their, their hot button issues. Um, so one of the things I do at the very beginning is send out a questionnaire of like, Hey, what feels most overwhelming to you? And a lot of times it's laundry, feeding people, keeping the house clean, just things like that. And so we come up with systems that help delegate things out to kids, help delegate things out to other people, eliminate things altogether, like things you don't need to be doing, um, and then getting automations in place. So your house can run smoother and be more productive and, and more peaceful. And so once we can have all that done, we then go down and make sure we're prioritizing the things that we want to be prioritizing. Because truthfully, truthfully, so many of the things I want to instill in my children, like you could ask me that question and I would have been like, well, I want them to learn Bible verses and I want them to learn good character and all these things, but I wasn't prioritizing that at all. Like I didn't have a game plan for that to make that happen. And so I really had to sit down and create a plan in our day and in our schedule to prioritize those things. And so none of this is like rocket science or anything. It's very simple. It's just having to sit down and do it and knowing how to do it efficiently where you're going to be able to follow through with it. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Because as a dad, a lot of those same things come to mind, you know, taking care of these kids and making sure they have some character qualities that, that you're proud to pass on. But I can't say that I have a, um, a long-term plan in place that necessarily always meets that. Yeah. I want to get it done, but I don't have a plan. Yeah. And I think that that most people are just so like, you're just going through the day, right? We got to eat breakfast. We got to get to school. We got to do X, Y, Z that we don't, we don't ever create that space in our day for that. And we don't ever create the space to actually plan it. And so we feel like we're too busy to plan it. And then we're so busy, not planning that we don't get anything done. Yeah. So with my coaching and then with also with my online courses, I focus a lot on just like, let's just take a minute. Cause if we do the work up front, like that's the hardest part. And then once we get these systems in play, 
they're like rocking and ready to go. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm still got my mind blown by the fact that I never thought you could send a kid with a babysitter to a, to a basic <laughs> appointment. <laughs> I'm telling you, that was like mind blown for the day. I mean, it's the little things in life when you're a mama, but that was just like light bulb. I love it. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm certain that you have a lot more tips like that. Now, I know that you know, anybody listening who's interested, who wants to get a hold of Laura, you can find her at mamasystems.net. And I'll have all the links to her social media and her website and everything in the show notes. And like I mentioned before, Apple Podcasts, for whatever reason, is doing weird stuff with links. And it just shows up as text instead of a link. So if you can't find it there, just go to fostercarenation.com. Hit the blog. The blog. I'll get it straight. At fostercarenation.com. Hit the the podcast blog button. Who English is leaving me today. <laughs> and I still have a couple hours left to do this today. Yeah. <laughs> but if you hit the, the uh, podcast blog button, you'll be able to find the, the episode there. Click on that. Everything will be in the show notes under there. Or I think there's a show notes tab on there as well. So you'll be able to find it for sure. And the links will work there. I'll make sure that they're all active there. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to kind of bring this back to Laura, because this is something that, that a lot of people resonate with and some people totally don't understand at all a lot of your journey seems to be motivated through your own spirituality and your family's your family's connection through to god and and the spiritual connection and how has that played out for you guys in your journey how has that that helped you and put you on that pathway as opposed to you know what most people just assume again you're just doing it for the money I just can't roll my eyes big enough for that. Um, <laughs> Jason, I think that almost every day I keep that in mind. And often when people ask me, like, do you regret adopting them? Because they're, they're really hard. I mean, they're just really hard. Like we didn't sign up for an easy journey here on the foster care thing. Um, and knowing like we don't have them just until they're 18. Like they're probably going to be living with us forever. And it's just, it's a lot. It's a lot of grief along with that. And so people often ask, like, are you, do you regret it? Are you sad that you did this? And I think my answer just always comes down to like, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we were called to do this and we were being obedient. And one day I'm going to be standing before my savior and I'm going to be able to say, yes, I was obedient. And like, that's all that matters. And if I don't do that, then I don't, I'm, I'm not doing it right. So I'm sorry, I'm crying. Um, but that's just something oh, I have to cling yeah. to every day because it, it's so hard. It's so hard. And I realize I just keep saying that same sentence over and again, but I like I knew it was going to be hard when we signed up. I don't think I knew. Like I know we didn't go into it with rose-colored glasses. Like I knew that there'd be issues, there'd be things. And I didn't know how my body would play out in all of that, like with all my thoughts and feelings and emotions and like I had all the with the right answers for attachment and like what we're supposed to do. And I just, I, I didn't know how all of me would respond to that. Does that make sense? Like I had the knowledge, but I didn't have everything else in order. And so, and not that you ever can have all that in order. It's a daily walking through and refining, but. Oh, yes. <sighs> yeah. Your passion is just very amazing. I, I know that you, you apologize for crying, but there's definitely no need for that. But your passion is very inspiring. Thank you. You know, Laura, I oftentimes ask people in, in an interview, what their, their, what is it? What sets your soul on fire? Yeah. And it's, I don't think that's a question that I need to ask you because we can see what sets your soul on fire. You know, that's we, those of us who, you know, most of us who have been in this journey very long understand, you know, I could, because I was raised in, in a church, right? And that's one of the things that, that I, I always thought about as I got a little bit older was there was those references that, what is it, James 127 reference about taking care of the widows and the orphans. And I looked at it and went, wow, <laughs> this one is kind of like it's swept under the rug. People are like, well... Yeah, except that I can't handle a kid with special needs. Yeah. And here you guys are with 10 kids, three of them with special needs. I mean, you're yeah. walking a hard road. 
And mind you, if they, if I would have known they all had special needs and the severity of this, I don't know if I would still be in the same, like, like I don't know if we would walk that journey, but clearly the Lord knew and he's given us grace for each day for that. So, you know, there, I, have to, I, I reference this a lot as well. There's a song I love the the line and it. it's an old Van Zant song. It says, You're not if you sing, are you? No, I'm not going to sing. Don't worry. I'm, I don't need to break anything. You here. don't have to plug your ears. But the line is, if you want to hear God laugh, just tell him your plans. <laughs> huh? <laughs> yes. You think you know what's best. You think you know what you're getting into. But but there's a different set of plans. And, and yours might not be the, the ultimate winner here. <laughs> Always. And I find that when we follow those moments of, of where we felt led, those are the moments that end up being the most rewarding in the long term. But but oftentimes they're the hardest in the short term. Yeah. You know, Amanda and I, you know, we got into it because after our second son was born, we couldn't have kids anymore. And, and um, we had looked at adoption and we'd looked at adoption through, um, through like a, a international adoption stuff and decided we couldn't do it. And, and that's kind of what, what we looked at foster care for just a moment. And after like, I don't know, a 10 minute conversation, we both felt like, like all of a sudden we were like, ah, this, this feels right. We just felt led in that direction. And we're not a highly spiritual family. We, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give you the name of denomination you have to go follow to, to be right like us or any of that, but, but we just really felt led in that direction. And I'm so glad that we, we followed that leading because yeah, it's been challenging. It's been challenging for sure. But but at the same time, I don't think we would be near the people we are today if we hadn't chosen to to follow that lead. I agree. It's definitely been a ton of a ton of refining on my end as well. <laughs> a lot yeah. of work done. Yeah, it's funny though that refining always takes place in some sort of heat, right? Yes. We yeah. walk to the fire and come out better off for it. <laughs> So you and your husband are, are looking at, at this journey as today. And what do you see in the future for your, for your family? Oh, that's a loaded question. Um, you got a lot of tough years coming up for sure. I mean, you, you've got a, you've got a lot of kids to walk through teen years and all that, but I, do you guys have, have a vision for what that's going to look like? Um. I feel like this is a loaded question right now because right now we're um, Andrew has kind of started, he's 10 and he's kind of started on the, he's not entering puberty yet, but he's, I feel like there's just some of those preteen. Yeah. Pre Those hormones are changing in them. Right. So last week we had two different occasions and he has, a, he can have a lot of anger. He's been known to throw things and yell and hit people, whatever. Right. I feel like that's normal. We expected that. Um, last week he had two like rage outrages and it really scared us. Like it was just really, it was really scary. He put his fist through a window. Um, I mean, it, it was just really scary. So we're trying to just figure out right now, like our house, our house is not built for, I mean, it's going to be destroyed period, but it's not built for being destroyed while keeping others safe right and so we haven't we haven't had to create a space for him yet that's like keeping him safe where he can get angry and rage and then also for our other kids to be safe um because he was also throwing things at other kids and trying to knock over furniture and throwing furniture and i mean it's just he could create a lot of damage when he's in this and so i feel like you're asking a bigger picture but all i can think of is like the next several years while we have young ones and he's going through teen years, like that feels the most overwhelming right now. Um, Cause again, nobody is, nobody's written a manual on this that I know of and like how to create a safe space and how to, how to build a room just for him where it's like, has the gym padding on it. And um, I don't know. So it just, that's, I don't know if that's what you asked. I don't think it's what you asked, but that's where my mind went when you asked that question. Well, here in about five or six years, I expect a book to come out. It's going to have your name on it because if nobody's written a book yet, Lord knows you should be able to. Oh, 
I don't want to. I just don't want to deal with it at all. It's so hard, guys. It's so hard. I feel you. You know, we, we've had kids come to us with traumas that we didn't really fully understand. And man, dealing with that's hard. For sure. Mm -hmm. Do you and your husband have, have any, any real help set up for you guys as well? I mean, you know, about what, five years ago now, um, we, we lost our oldest daughter and we started, um, we started therapy with a guy. It's been several years. Yeah. Tom. Yeah. And, and Dr. Tom, by the way, I don't think he listens to our podcast, but if he did, he should know he's awesome. Um, but he's not the first guy we went to, right? The, the first guy I went and found, I went, nah, not him. Right. But we found a guy to, to help us walk through some of our own struggles, you know, because, you know, our, our childhoods were, were differing from each other, but we had our own, our own places of, of trauma to, to come that we brought into this, into this situation. And so these yeah, kids we bring, were young parents. I mean, we, we yeah. had a lot of odds stack, stacked against us. And so we've had to find somebody who can help us walk through that and do it to the best of our ability. And have you and your husband found anything like that to help you guys struggle through it? Yes. I'm also a big believer in that our trauma comes out immensely when they're, when they're acting out and their trauma is going on. Um, that's when I'm at my finest, you know? So I, I, found that that's, I feel you mama. Yeah. Like I, I, I couldn't do without my counselor. She is amazing and wonderful and has been such a help in me processing through my childhood stuff and knowing how to respond to these buddies and kind of working through what's really going on there. Knowing what's really going on there and not, um, taking it out on them because of my crap. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Uh, there are so many times that my children have triggered things from my past, my traumas, you know, it, it happens. And when that happens, we're not at our finest. Yeah. You know, there's, there's been plenty of times that I've had to go back to my children and say, Hey, I acted in a way that I'm not proud of, you know, can you please, please forgive me? You know, I, I shouldn't have said that, or I shouldn't have acted this way, you know, and that's one thing we're, we're age appropriately open with our children. I love that. So, yeah. Yeah. That's such a tough thing. Um, uh, you know, you and your husband are walking through this, like, like there's a marriage there that, that plans on surviving, I assume. So how does that, uh, how, how does that look for you guys to work through that? Yeah. Well, we, we've prioritized a weekly date night, um, just to make sure that we're connecting every week and that we know what's going on in each other's lives and we can just touch base on all things. Um, because so many times, I mean, like I'll see him, he works from home, so I see him all day long. And so it doesn't feel like something that I need to like put on the calendar and prioritize, but I feel like our living together all day long doesn't really mean anything because we have small talk, but we don't really sit down and connect. And so we've prioritized that Thursday night is our date night and that's what we do. So I assume you put that on the calendar, right? Oh, it's on the calendar. <laughs> nobody been, else can, can plan anything. <laughs> I have a friend of mine who says the things, the things that get scheduled, get done. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Because we might plan a date night, but if we don't put it on the calendar, it can get overrun by something else. Really? Yes, and it does. Well, Laura, you guys have an amazing story and, and a lot of struggles that you found your ways through your way through and a lot of struggles that you're still working through and just coming on here and being open and honest and vulnerable and letting everybody else understand that you have struggles because people want to look at us sometimes and kind of lionize us as this, as this saint. And by God, my sainthood is, is still the verdict is out. <laughs> we'll just say that. Something the, holds up your halo. <laughs> yeah, something does. I think there's a little one on either side. You just can't see him very well. But yeah, so so just coming in and talking about that is, has been something that hopefully the listeners can understand. This is a tough journey and it's worth it at the same time. Yes. Amen. <laughs> so we really appreciate your time here today for sure. Thank hey, you. Thank for, you so for much for having us. Okay, Foster Care Nation, thanks for listening to Laura's story. Now take her knowledge and wisdom to heart so you can create love and healing in your family and community. And be sure to come back next week. We have a new episode every Tuesday. 
If you'd like to share your story as a guest, you can reach us at fostercareuj at gmail.com. You can connect with other like-minded people on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash fostercareuj. And don't forget, we have a Patreon where you can support our mission for as little as $5 a month. It's at patreon.com slash fostercarenation. The links to everything are in the show notes on your podcast player or at fostercarenation.com. And as always... You are so super awesome. I thank you guys. Thank you.